Well, thank you again for being here. Let's, uh, let's just take a moment. Let's pray. And then we're going to uh, share a few things with you. And then we'll go right into worship here in a few moments. Heavenly Father, thank you for all who are here tonight. We're gathered in your name, Jesus. And when we gather in your name, you are in the midst of us. And I pray that above everything tonight, eyes would be set on you, Jesus. Eyes would be set on you in such a way that we can not only see you in a, in a way that your word comes alive to us tonight, but also hear from you. And I want to pray for each one of us to have those receptive hearts that are ready to receive all that you have tonight. We, uh, we pray for our, our country, Lord. It's been a challenging week, a lot of elections going on in our state here. And we just want to pray, Jesus, your will be done here. Uh, would you bring us to back to that place of righteousness, Lord, and, and truly be able to say, in God we trust. We just pray that over our city, our state, our nation, Lord. Would you remind people what our roots were and uh, how we started with you, Lord. And I pray we'd come back to you. May this nation come back to Jesus, Lord. And we just invite your spirit now. <clears throat> Move amongst us. Speak to us. Open blind eyes, Lord, where we've been blinded to the things that we don't see or understand in your spirit. I pray that we would see very clearly tonight. And I want to pray over your people, Lord, that they would receive all that you have. You've got some amazing things uh, that you've been preparing for us for this weekend. And so we're here ready to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I want to give you a, an overview here. And if you'll uh, <clears throat> look back at the wall there, uh, as you leave the, uh, through one of the exits there, you can see our, our new banner. It says, Disciple, Be One, Make One, right? And we've actually got two of them. One's being printed and not yet here yet. But we, uh, that's our, our new mantra here. It's, it's been our mantra. We've been talking about discipleship and we've been doing discipleship over the years. But now we're getting more focused and we're really feeling the Holy, feel like the Holy Spirit has told our leadership over the last few months here. It's time to get a laser focus on that. It's time to get that out of just being the trailer that we pull behind the truck, right? And let's make it the engine of our truck, right? Let's, let's make it the engine that really drives this ministry and our lives, being a disciple of Jesus Christ and making disciples. Anybody up for that? Okay, we got one hand there. That's good. Okay. Um, hopefully we'll have more hands that go up by the end of the, of the weekend here. No, we're, we're going to be talking about that, and I'm excited to have uh, Lee Grady with us, and he's really got a lot of experience in this area and is going to be able to take us into these waters, and it's going to be really good. But before Lyndall comes up to share a little bit about um, Lee and his ministry, I want to give you just some uh, direction here for the weekend. So tomorrow we'll get together at 845. And we'll have a continental breakfast, and we'll have two sessions in the morning, and then we'll have a lunch, um, and lunch will be provided. And we've got it catered, and then we've got um, one more session in the afternoon. So we're looking at about 8.45 to 2 p.m. tomorrow. If you didn't know that schedule, um, that's, that's the plan. And tonight, um, <clears throat> we... Uh, we want to do some preliminary things and do some introductions, but then we want to get into worship. And in that worship time, we just invite you to, to step in and really experience the presence of the Lord because the Lord is here in a powerful way. I believe he, I believe we're going to see some powerful things happen in the life of this church. This is a, this is a big moment. It really is. And I just feel like the Lord's been uh, putting this on our heart for well over a year. Uh, Lyndall and, and myself and Juliana, we've been talking about this for quite a while. And to see it actually come into fruition and for Lee to actually be here with us, this is a huge moment here. And so we're really looking forward to some powerful things in the spirit. But as I was praying this week and spending some time and just uh, looking ahead to this moment here and putting some final details together as, as our staff was, I felt like the Holy Spirit was speaking uh, to me. I was praying and as, as I was looking up at the mountains and uh, don't you love seeing the snow up there on the mountains already here in November? We definitely need it and we're praying for more. Um, <clears throat> and we look over these last two years, it's been hard. Um, anybody had some challenges you faced? I'm not just talking about COVID. I'm talking about the drought we've been in, right? Some, uh, some, uh, um, some wells that have gone dry and we've got some wells that have been had to, having to be redug and, and now are being replenished and that's great. But as I looked up at the mountains, I felt like, uh, and then I was praying, Lord, please just build that snowpack and replenish our reservoirs because we so need it right now and in this coming season. The Holy Spirit dropped a word in my heart and he says, uh, Brian, this, is, <clears throat> uh, this weekend is the beginning of replenishing and I am bringing, that I am bringing to the body of Christ this weekend. 
And so I hope you're coming ready to receive. Um, we're going to give as we go out of here and we do the ministry God's called us to. But <clears throat> I want to invite you into the receiving that God has for you tonight because he wants to pour himself into you. Psalm chapter 36 verse 9 says, For you, Lord, are the fountain of life. You are the fountain of life. <clears throat> Anybody need replenishing right now? Anybody need some refilling in the spirit, right? It's been a crazy two years, two and a half years, right? It's been challenging, <clears throat> not only the summers and the, and the drought, but some of the other things, many other things that we've gone through. And I believe the Lord is just saying, as Jesus said very clearly, come to me, all of you who are what? Heavy laden, your labor and heavy laden, right? And I will give you rest, right? Anybody ready for some rest tonight? In fact, maybe you could just do that. Just take a deep breath right now. Just breathe in the life of the spirit. He's here. He's going to be breathing into you and upon you. He's going to be awakening some things in you, maybe uh, as far as vision and direction for your life. And I just want to just speak over you, just kind of an activation in the spirit here. Let's be activated that we're really going to give our full attention to the Lord because he truly is that fountain of life and he wants to replenish you. He wants, I want to, I just want to see you walk out of this place even tonight, full and overflowing. Amen. Anybody ready for that? In filling, yeah. Let's just take a moment then and be still before the Lord here. He's calling us to his fountain, who he is as a fountain, to himself. He's calling you. And with your, just, if you want to close your eyes, you can, but just begin to visualize in your mind, you are posturing yourself, you're, you're positioning yourself in a place where you're going to allow the heaviness that has been on our shoulders to be lifted, and you're going to allow the replenishing of the Spirit to be poured over you. And so Lord, I just pray for it right now. In the spirit, we just want to pray for the activation of your Holy Spirit. And you might even want to just pray in your prayer language right now. Just pray in the spirit here. Let's just begin to invite Jesus and his spirit to have his way in us. Maybe you even want to just verbalize a prayer to the Lord. Lord, I'm ready. Lord, I'm open. Lord, I'm, I'm thirsty for you. And let's just, um, let's just take a few moments here to to interact with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we, come, we just come with that expectant and ready hearts right now because you truly are that fountain that never runs dry. And Jesus, you said these words that you're going to send to us a comforter and he's going to fill us with his power, the Holy Spirit. And we pray for that tonight in Jesus' name. We just open the door. Come on in, Holy Spirit. Come on in, Jesus Christ. Come on in, Abba Father. You are the center of our focus this evening and of our lives, Lord. We invite your replenishing tonight in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's just take a moment. I'd like you to just listen and maybe even just ask this question, Lord, what do you have for me? What do you have for me this evening? God, we thank you that you are always speaking. You're always ministering to us. You're always releasing heaven to us. And I want to pray this evening especially, we will be receivers, good receivers tonight, receiving all that you have, whether it be a word spoken to us personally or maybe even corporately, there's some ministry that you want to do. We open that door, allowing your gifts to flow and your ministry to work deeply and powerfully in each person's life here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll stay in that receiving mode. And, and I would invite you, uh, there is paper at the back table there if you need uh, something to take notes with. We've got pens in your little pockets of your seats there. But I really encourage you, uh, write things down. Maybe it's even just one word the Lord drops in your heart. He's going to speak to you. He really, and maybe, you are, I hope he already has, but my prayer is that each person will truly receive uh, words from the Lord, direction from the Lord, vision from the Lord. But let's uh, position ourselves where we're ready to receive. Everybody, everybody ready to receive? Are we good, we're good receivers here tonight? Awesome. Let's give it up for Pastor Lindell as he comes to introduce Lee Grady.
Good evening, everyone. Okay, I know a few of you are still awake after that meal because I heard somebody respond, but how about the rest of you? I mean, food coma, anyone yet? I see that hand, brother. I'll pray for you. No. I'm really excited for tonight and this whole weekend um, because I get to share with you something that I've had the honor and the privilege of having poured into my life, and that is my friend Lee Grady. Uh, we figured up it's been about 13 years that we've known each other, starting at a church in a small town in Illinois, um, traveling through South Dakota all the way to Oregon, and being here now. And when I, when I think of Lee, I mean, I could tell you about all these amazing co- accomplishments. He's an ordained minister. He's an award-winning journalist. He's written tons of books. He's the director of the Mordecai Project, where it's empowering women around the globe not just in the nation. He's, he's a voice for women pastors. Can I hear an amen on that? I can tell you all this cool stuff, but when I think of Lee, I think of what God has done in my life from Lee. And there's a, these people I call hinge people. And those are the people that God uses to open doors, not just physically, not just in a place, but in the spirit, in your heart, in your life. You know, when I think of my friend Lee, that's what I think of. The times he's poured into me, he's seen me in high times and he's seen me in some really rough times. And the thing I know about Lee is he loves me the same in both. And he's just that kind of person who wants to pour into the next generation and not let it stop just with him. It's too big for just him. He wants to see others ignited with the passion of the spirit, with the power of the spirit and speaking the words of life that Jesus gives them to those around them to see them grow and develop. So this is going to be his introduction because once we start worship here in just a moment, if the team wants to come on up, we're just going to keep flowing tonight. I didn't want to break it apart with an introduction a little bit later and be like, oh, well, okay, now we got to reset because somebody's going to be speaking. Because I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I think as we transition, you're just going to hear the Spirit speaking to you where you're at, with what you're walking through, with what's going on in your life. And I think it's going to challenge you, it's going to encourage you, And honestly, my prayer is that it ignites you. That's not just something where you feel like you got a pat on the back or a little plug tonight. But I I just shared with them before service that I really feel like there's people in here who are going to have callings reignited tonight. That there's people who are going to have visions restored tonight because it's it's not going to be this big nebulous thing way out in the, the dark void that you have to seek out and figure out and all this stuff. It's just coming back to what Jesus told us to do. And that is go and make disciples. To be the people who are willing to invest in other people. So tonight, Father, we come and we give our time to you. We give this space to you. Holy Spirit, would you come and speak to us tonight, however you want to do it. Because even though Lee's here and I love Lee and I know he has powerful words to say, I know his heart is to say what you want him to say. And so tonight, we just create that space. We create this time. And we say, not our will, but yours be done, Father. We say, Holy Spirit, come and speak to us where we're at. But would you come and just ignite fires tonight, Holy Spirit? Would you reignite passions and desires? Would you reignite dreams and visions? Would you once again mobilize your church for the mission that it has to accomplish? And that is to go into the world and make disciples of all men. We give this time to you in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together as we move into worship. And I want to just give you the freedom to move tonight. <clears throat> if there's a position that you want to get in as far as your worship and moving towards the front here, you're welcome to that. There are some flags at the back if you'd like to wave some flags. Uh, on your knees, on your feet, uh, lifting your hands, wherever you feel led to go. We just invite you here tonight. Jesus invites us, come to me. Come to me, all of you. All of you, he says, come to me. So Lord, we do tonight. We come to you. We begin this time together here of the service portion here by coming to you, Jesus, the miracle maker, the miracle worker, the life giver, the fountain. May all of your people here tonight be refreshed in Jesus' name.
This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise. Where every demon trembles, where we proclaim your praise. Sing it again. This is a house of worship. This is a place. closed here for just a moment. Just say, have a conversation with Jesus Christ. Again, we're coming to him. And if you could just have a face to face with him right now, what's the heavy burden you need to lay before him? What's the challenge from this week or what's been just recurring over the last few weeks? And Jesus is saying, are you really going to give that to me now? Are you really going to cast that care on me? Or are you going to keep trying to carry it yourself? We give it to you, Jesus. Give it, let's give it all to Jesus. Can we do that? Let's give all of our praise, but also everything else. Can we give it all to him tonight? Lay your entire life on the altar tonight of worship. Jesus, I pray for your people tonight. We can empty ourselves of us and everything that we're concerned about so that we can come and truly step into you and who you are. Thank you, Jesus. Whatever you need to do, you might need to lift your hands right now to the Lord. Release that heavy load or that anxiety to him. That relationship that you can't change, you don't have the power to. It's only through Jesus Christ, right? Let's give it all to him right now. We give it all to you, Jesus. Remove every barrier, Lord, I pray. Anything that's keeping us from receiving the fullness of your spirit tonight, would you remove barriers? And bring us into that holy union, we pray in Jesus' name. Come down, heaven come down. The 
somebody that needs healing tonight. If there is, let's give that infirmity to Jesus. Just lift your hands to him right now. Let's do the holy exchange for the night. Give that infirmity, that sickness to him and let Jesus bless you. His healing touch in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. By your wounds and stripes, you are healed. As the violin just continues to play over Spirit is releasing that healing power. Thank you. 
proclaim this over ourselves, over this service tonight, over our community. Jesus Messiah.
Jesus Messiah The name above all names Oh blessed Redeemer Emmanuel The rescue for sin Jesus said in John 13, he said, you are my disciples if you love one another. I see that love of God here in this room tonight. And if you can picture Jesus just speaking that over you, you are my disciple. You're my disciple. You're not just a disciple. You're not just a believer, a Christian. He takes ownership of your heart because you've given him that access to you. So let him speak that over you right now. You are my disciple, says the Lord. As we hear that, we have a choice to make. We're going to make room for him to not only be Lord, but be our first love. We're going to make room for him to have his way in us and move things around on the inside and in our lives externally too. Let's just make room for Jesus to have his perfect way here. As we prepare for the word here tonight, let's make plenty of room for Jesus to be Lord and the Holy Spirit to move in his way that he wants to tonight. And I will make room for you. Yes, I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to, whatever you want to, Lord. I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to, whatever you want to. I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to. Whatever you want to. up the ground of all my tradition and break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is 
is better, Lord. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground. Oh, shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. you want whatever you want to yes I will make room for you do whatever you want to whatever you want to and I will make room for you Lord. do whatever you want to Whatever you want to, and I will make room for you, Lord. We make room for you. Do whatever you want to, whatever you want to, we make room. Make room for you. Hey, y'all. Before you take your seat, and I notice a few of you already have done that. So if you already took your seat, would you mind standing up one more time? And I'm going to ask that you go to somebody near you and give them a really good hug. Would you do that? And then would you go to somebody, it can be the same person or somebody else, and say, I need you. And after you say that, I want you to say, you need me. Uh, you need me and I need you. And I'm so glad I'm with you. Okay, you can have your seats. Thank you so much. So let's just get a couple of things uh, straight. So I am not from around here. Is it okay if I say y'all? I am from Georgia, and this is, uh, this is my first time to Central Oregon. Um, based, based on what I've experienced the last 24 hours, all I know is y'all like to eat. <laughs> Not that different from Georgia. <laughs> it's wonderful to be with you, and um, so, so blessed and thankful that my my friendship with Lyndall turned into this because you know when you meet people you never know where that's going to lead and uh, I've known Lyndall now for almost 14 years and his family and um, and then last year he came to a, a men's event that I did in South Dakota and he brought Nathan Carmack <laughs> and I learned a little bit about him and about his church and heard about this four square church in the middle of rural Oregon. And then it turned out, turned into this. And yesterday I got to meet your pastor and then tonight here we are. So I'm just really, really excited about this weekend. Um, 
this whole thing came about, I think, because, um, well, Lyndall, I guess Lyndall talks about me, but also I had a book that came out uh, this year about discipleship, and I believe that he talked about that book or shared that book with some people, and some of you maybe already read that, I don't know, but it has turned into a passion because your pastor already had this passion, and so I think the book maybe just poured some gasoline on his fire, and so we're hoping that this weekend we're going to just pour a huge, huge drum of gasoline on your fire and that this church is going to uh, be ablaze. Amen? So the way we crafted this weekend, um, we, have, we have some sessions tomorrow morning and one closing ministry time in the afternoon, but I told Pastor Brian that before we get into anything practical about discipleship, about how do you do it, what does it look like, et cetera, because I know, I, th- I know some of you, you know, you're thinking we're going to get some training here, and you are, but before we get training, we have to lay a foundation on what it means to be relational. What I'm bringing to you this weekend is what we call relational discipleship. And so some of you may think when we say discipleship, you may automatically think back to something of your past. And maybe you went to a class on Wednesday nights or, you know, you did a discipleship book. Uh, You went to a discipleship course of some kind. There's nothing wrong with those things. But discipleship is not a class. Discipleship flows out of our relationships with each other. And if you want to be a disciple maker, you have to be relational. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. If you guys would put my slides up there, please. Uh, What we're going to to hit on tonight, lay this foundation, uh, is that you cannot grow without relationships. Now, some of this may seem really basic to you. And that's okay because I'm going to be, I'm I'm a pretty basic guy. I'm not deep. I'm not complicated, okay? I don't don't think that we need to talk so deep that people, you know, can't figure out what you're talking about. And also, I want you to be able to share these same principles and concepts with others. You guys are the ones who are going to be teaching others about what we're talking about this weekend. Everybody shake your heads, yes. Don't sit there and go, oh, well, he's talking about, he's talking to Pastor Brian. He's talking to Lyndall. No, I'm talking to you. Everybody in here is going to be disciple makers because that's what Jesus called us to do. But you have to be relational in order to be a disciple maker. And you may go, well, what does that mean? What does that mean to be relational? Aren't all Christians relational? Actually, no, they're not. Because we have created a culture in the church that is what we call spectator, a spectator mentality. So we come to church, we sit in a chair, we listen to someone, we sing songs, and then we go home and we live our life. And then we come back to church and we do it again. And we just are watching. And some Christians have this attitude of, when I walk into church, I have a large wall in front of me. And don't ask me to do anything and don't ask me to say anything to anybody because I have my own life and I'm, I'm living behind these walls. Now, you probably are not that way because you're here on a Friday night. Most people wouldn't do that. You're here, I believe, because you're hungry for what we're talking about. But we got to discover that the church of Jesus Christ is a community of people And we have to learn how to live in community. So if you go to the next slide, some of you who are older in here, you will recognize this person. (laughs) This is the most iconic image in American advertising. He is known as the Marlboro Man. Those of you who are younger, you don't know who in the world that is. You've never seen that. Because in the 1970s, we outlawed print and TV advertising of cigarettes. So you can't see those anymore. But back in the 60s and part of the 70s, 
you always saw this guy on TV and in magazines. And he was always like this. He was always on a horse. I was told that this is cowboy country. <laughs> so uh, he was always out in the great west somewhere. He was always wearing a cowboy hat. Always had a cigarette in his mouth. But what was the other common denominator? He was always, always alone. And this was actually a very subliminal message, particularly to men, that tells men that if you want to be really tough, if you want to be a tough guy, you got to be a loner. And a lot of people bought into that. A lot of men bought into that. Well, actually, guys, this is bunk. That's not Bible, not scriptural at all. Uh, so he went away. The, the guy who was always in those ads actually died of lung cancer, sadly. <laughs> Very sad. But the idea of a loner is still with us. If you go to this next slide, you will see some of the images of the current heroes in our culture. Most of these comic book heroes are also loners. They go off and they do their own thing, especially Batman, who you know, stands on the edge of the skyscraper, brooding, looking over the city, always alone. Uh, now, Han Solo, he did have a sidekick. Um, I don't know how they communicated because I don't know what language that was he used. Superman, you know, comes here uh, from another planet, grows up with foster parents. And, of course, and then Ray from the newer Star Wars, she's also, you know, an orphan who is off brooding and everybody's brooding and everybody's lonely and it's all supposed to be so cool. We're supposed to be really impressed by this. That is not how it works in the kingdom. Amen? We are not supposed to be trying to do this alone. We are called to be helping each other, encouraging one another. We are linked. We are, we are connected to one another. And that is the way Jesus engineered this. Okay, His church is to be connected. So I want to give you this very simple kindergarten scripture from John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, everybody say, by this, by this. all men will know that you are my, my disciples if you wear the right Christian t-shirt. <laughs> or if you vote for the right candidate. No. Or if you have the right bumper sticker on your car. No. How will they know that we are his disciples? If we have love for one another. How many of you believe that our love quotient in the church of Jesus Christ in this country needs to go up? I don't know about you, but the last two and a half years have been have been difficult for me, not just because of a virus or lockdowns or masks or all those other things that I hated. The worst thing that happened during COVID was to see how hateful we have become to each other. And sometimes that even happened in the church. So of all times in history right now, the church of Jesus has got to, we've got to up our game in this area and we've got to learn how to love each other. So I have this statement that I make. If you go to that next slide, it says Christianity is horizontal. Now, what do I mean by that? Because obviously we know that Jesus Christ came from heaven to reconcile us to the Father. So Christianity is vertical. And we know that when Jesus died on the cross... You know, there was a, a, a tr some people believe it was a tree, uh, you know, that, that he was crucified on. And they put that bar there. But that, that tree he was nailed to. And it was, you know, he, he, he died for us on that tree to reconcile us vertically to the Father. Are you grateful for what Jesus did for you on that cross? 
that he, that he made it possible for us to know the Father and to be forgiven by the Father. But he also stretched out his arms this way, and he was nailed to that cross horizontally. So when he died on the cross, he did not just die so that we could be reconciled vertically to the Father. He also died so that we could learn to love one another. That's why it's a cross. <laughs> so Christianity is horizontal, and you know that means that we have got to take this seriously about our responsibility and about our our fellowship, our our relationships with one another. Because I sometimes hear Christians say this. I hear people say, well, it's just me and Jesus. I'm sure they don't ever say that in Oregon. You know, it's like I get up in the morning, I have my coffee, I listen to my favorite preacher, my favorite podcast, and then I get my worship and I have my quiet time and I listen to my, uh, you know, whatever's on my playlist and I'm lost in worship and then I get dressed and then I get in my car and I start driving to work and I get in, I don't know, do you guys have traffic in Primeville? <laughs> That's kind of hard to believe, but <laughs> I live near Atlanta, Georgia, so... Um, and then you get on, in the, on the road and then somebody, you know, cuts you off and then you're rolling down your window and saying some very choice words to those people or making gestures because it's just like, you know, and, and hopefully you don't have the Christian bumper sticker on your car at that moment. But a lot of us have that attitude that it really doesn't matter about that. I just want that precious sweet time with Jesus. But, you know, the Bible actually says in 1 John, if you don't love people, you don't love God. So your love for God is actually revealed in the way that you treat others. 1 Peter 1, 22, a very important verse. It says, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren fervently love one another from the heart now the cool thing about this is that word fervently it means in the greek it can mean stretched which means folks that if we really want god's love in our hearts for people we're going to have to be stretched to be able to do that and guess how we get stretched he puts people in our lives who are hard to love. And then when you choose to love them, ugh, you have to stretch, you have to strain. And guess what? When you do that, your heart actually expands, your love expands, and you grow in the love of God. Now, I don't know about this church. I've only been here 24 hours. I don't know how hard people are to love in this church. <laughs> but if has God ever brought brother or sister sandpaper into your life? <laughs> and we say, well, I don't really want to be around that person. Or, but God will put those people in your life, in your past, so that you can grow in the grace of to love the way he loves. Amen. Some of these things are a little hard. This is going to be stretching this weekend. So I've just, I've learned through my years as walking with Jesus. That we've got to become relational people. And then when God laid this whole message on my heart about discipleship. You know, I realize that we're, we're in a crisis right now because God is telling us, I want you to invest your lives in others. Uh, there's a lot of people in the church who need to be discipled. There's a lot of people who need to grow in the knowledge of Jesus. They need to learn how to study the Bible. They need to learn how to pray. They need to learn how to develop an intimate relationship with Jesus. And they don't do that just by osmosis, just by showing up in a church building. They have to have people in their lives who show them how to do that. And that's what we're going to be talking about this weekend but we have to make a choice. And what I'm asking you to do tonight, 
before we head into anything practical tomorrow about this, is that you need to make a decision that you're going to become a relational Christian. Now, some of you, maybe this is not an issue for you. But I have a feeling that where we are right now, and even because of what we've just been through for the last two and a half years, we've got to make some decisions. And I'm going to ask you to make three decisions tonight, very simple decisions. I want you to write these three things down. Number one is that you must come out of hiding. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying this very strongly to the church in America right now. Because of what we've come out of, I think you guys probably were a little slower coming out of COVID than we were in Georgia. Uh, But there are still people in my state who don't go to church because of COVID. People got very comfortable. Uh, You know, all of a sudden we're not meeting. We're meeting on Zoom. We're meeting on Facebook. We're, you know, we can go to church in our pajamas. We get up on Sundays and we just go from the bed to the living room and we watch church and it got very very comfortable for a lot of people and then and then some people thought oh you know I don't I don't really have to watch my church I can watch (laughs) you know this church that I like in Houston or this church I like in in Atlanta or you know I can just kind of surf the channel and then I can just get all this great input and you know things got kind of squirrely Um, And then there are people who have dropped off. Did you notice that there was some people who never came back to church after COVID? And we probably still have some people like that here in Primeville. So we have to decide that we're not, not just about going back to church, but we are embracing everything that the Bible says to us about why fellowship is important And about why assembling together is important. Because you can't make a disciple without teaching them that. So there is a word in, go ahead to the next slide. There's a word in the New Testament. It's a big Greek word. I want us to practice saying it right now. We're going to say this word koinonia. Everybody say that. Write that down if you can. I've got the correct spelling there in the Greek. Koinonia is a very important concept, principle in the Bible. I love this principle. It's the word, the Greek word for fellowship. And it first appears in the Bible in Acts chapter 2. And I have that verse here, Acts 2, 42. Now remember, the Holy Spirit was just poured out in the beginning of Acts chapter 2. The wind, the fire shows up. There's tongues of fire on everyone's head. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They speak in tongues. And then 3,000 people are saved. And then it, it, this word emerges. It appears in Acts 2. It says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So fellowship was one of the core things that they were doing. And that word means this intense, close connection that happens among Christians. And let me tell you, the reason why this word does not appear until Acts 2 is because true Christian fellowship does not happen until the Holy Spirit comes. It actually is a result of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes fellowship possible. So when I met Lyndall DeCamp in 2009 in a place called Pittsfield, Illinois, can you imagine? Uh, There was like this supernatural click that happened. I met him and it was like I'd known him for years. And, And it was like this, hey, you know, where have you been all my life? There was a supernatural what the Bible calls a bond, the bond of the Holy Spirit that happens, right? How many of you have felt that before? You meet somebody, a believer, and all of a sudden it feels like, man, I really, I feel like I've known them, and I want to know them, and I want to spend time with them. It's because the Holy Spirit in you is connecting to the Holy Spirit in them, And there's a supernatural bond that happens. And God puts people together like that. He connects his people together for his purpose, for his kingdom purpose. 
And he wants those bonds to be tight. Okay? So naturally, if you spend time with people, and you pray for them, and you, and you eat with them, and you, uh, you know, go to church with them, and you spend time together, and you, go, you have coffee, and, and you're doing life together, those bonds are going to become very, very strong, and you're going to have these close fellowship with people and close relationships. That is normal Christianity. Hello? Now, you may think, oh, yeah, I have that. Or you may go, I think maybe I'm lacking a little bit in that area. And this weekend, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit, I, I told Pastor Brian, I'm praying that Jesus will just pull the strings tighter in this church so that y'all just like get closer. It's important for us to be like that, to be a body, to be connected like that. Now, when I think about fellowship, I want to show this picture. This is a group of believers from a church in Puerto Rico. Um, I started going to this church probably about 10 years ago. It's called Casa del Padre, how, uh, Father's House. And uh, the pastor and his wife are in that picture in the middle. And these are their leaders. And um, uh, the first time I went to this church, in it's near San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, I was preaching there on a Sunday morning. And uh, they told me that the church was going to start at, I think, uh, 1030 in the morning. And uh, so came. It was not a large building. Their, their, fellows, I mean, their sanctuary was not as big as this. They were very cramped in there. And so uh, we had worship. I preached. We had some ministry. And then... Everybody got up and they started moving things around and they brought tables in, kind of like you have now, and, uh, and the moving chairs. And then they brought the food. Whew. I mean, like more food than is in there. And all these uh, Puerto Rican delicacies. And if you've ever been around Puerto Rican people, they are very, very loud. They are funny and they are just, you know, lots of laughter. And so there's all this talking and laughing and eating and we're eating and talking and laughing for a long long time and I'm just at the table enjoying fellowship with Pastor Luis and some of his uh, leaders and talking and eating and laughing and going back and getting more food and, and more laughter and more talking and then I looked at my watch and it was five o'clock in the afternoon and I was like whoa where did the time go and I couldn't believe that we had been fellowshipping for that long. The love in that room was tangible. I've never been around Christians who loved each other so much. And then Pastor Luis came over to me and said, Lee, now I know you're probably tired and maybe you want to go back to your room. But uh, he said, some of us are going over to so-and-so's house. And they have a, it's an apartment. They have a swimming pool. And we're going to go swimming and we're going to have some more food. And we're going <laughs> to... And we're going to fellowship some more. And so I said, sure, I don't want to be by myself. So I went with them and we ate and we fellowshiped more. And when I looked at my watch again, it was 10 o'clock at night. All day we were together fellowshipping. Now you may say, well, that's kind of extreme. Or you might say they don't do that in Oregon. <laughs> but you know what? I think that's how it was in the New Testament church. I think they loved each other so much that if you walked in on them, you'd be like, who are these people? And you know what? I think I can tell that they've been with Jesus because their love is so intense. You know, we use this verse, go to the next slide, Hebrews 10, 25. We sometimes use this verse to beat people over the head about why they don't come to church. Uh, but I don't really think that was the point of the scripture. But let's, let's go over it one more time. It says, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The author of Hebrews is telling us that the reason why we go to church is not to tick off some box or to let everybody know that we're, we're good. You know, we, we did our time this week. The reason why you go to church is to encourage somebody else. You don't go just to hear a sermon 
And that's one reason why a lot of Christians today are faltering is because their attitude is, I go to church to get what I need, not to give. This verse says you go to church to encourage people. When you get up and you're getting dressed and you're praying about the service, it's not, Lord, speak to me and give me uh, the, 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 the word that I need. I mean, you can pray that. That's great. You may be desperate to hear a word from God. It's okay to pray that. But you should be praying, Lord, who am I supposed to be ministering to today? Who, who needs a word from, from me today? Who needs a word of encouragement from me? That's why we should be, that's our motivation for going and why we need to be together. So, my number one uh, question for you is, have you fully come out of hiding so that we can be this body of Christ that we're supposed to be? The fact that you're here this weekend to go to a discipleship seminar tells me that most of you have, but some of us have still got some walls up. And it's going to be really important for you this weekend to let down those walls. Number two, the next thing I'm going to ask you to do, this is going to get a little personal. Are you all okay with that? Let go of your hurts. A lot of people today have been hurt by church. It happens. It's real. Church hurt is real. I'm not minimizing that. I'm not telling you it doesn't exist. But I'm just saying that Whatever happened to you, you're going to have to let go of it. Um, go to the next slide. You know, I spent a lot of my time investing in uh, young people and particularly young men. And so as it happens, I end up doing a lot of counseling with guys who are hoping to get married. And they're, you know, they've had relationship uh, issues and... Um, you know, I'll be talking to some of these young guys who are getting a little bit older. Maybe they're 28, 29, kind of like Nathan's age. <laughs> and, um, and I'm saying, well, do you want to get married? Yes. And I said, well, what's holding you back? And, the, and they get a little sheepish. And then they're like, well, you know, I, I was in love with this girl and. Uh, it didn't work out. She dumped me and it, she broke my heart. And so then I get out my little miniature violin. And I start playing the world's smallest violin sympathy song for them. And I'm like, come on, get over it. I always have to say to these guys, look, relationships are always a risk. Can you write that down? Relationships always, always have risk involved. So if this guy wants to ask this girl out, I'm like, you know, all you have to do is just ask her out for coffee. You know, it doesn't have to be a date. Just say, do you want to go get some coffee? Just be friends. Just try it. You know, and they're so afraid to do that because they've been hurt. And so they, it's hard for them to let go of the pain of that past relationship. But I'm going, if you don't get over this, you're never going to be able to step over the line and ask some girl to go to coffee. And you're never going to ever get to the point where you're going to get married. You're going to be living at home in your parents' basement. So get over it. Um, before you go to the next slide, please don't yet. I want to say that, um, you know, I've met so many Christians who tell me that they've stopped going to church. They've given up on church because somebody hurt them. You know, the pastor didn't speak to them one day when they were walking out or somebody in a committee in the church, you know, there was some drama can you imagine drama? Somebody was rude to them. And I'm like, you know, I get it. I understand that. But here's the point. If you, 
if what you're telling me is that you really want to go to a perfect church where everybody acts like Jesus. But the problem is if you go to that church, then it's not going to be perfect anymore. Because you're not perfect. You actually could hurt someone yourself. Is that true? So I decided that I should start a side business. I'm, I've, I think that I'm going to ma- manufacture these signs, if you can put it up there, that we should put these signs in the parking lot. You know, when I go to a hotel, I stay in a lot of hotels, and they always have a sign next to the swimming pool that says, swim at your own risk. It says, you know, you, if you're a guest here, we don't pay for a lifeguard. We're not going to hire a lifeguard. If you go swimming in our pool, you do it at your own risk. If you drown, it's your problem. We're not paying you a dime. That's basically what the hotel is saying. I think we need to put signs like this in the church to remind people that when you walk in these doors, yes, the people in this church are not perfect. There's, the grace of God is working in them. They're, they're, they're yielding to the Holy Spirit. They're trying to become more like Jesus, but they're not there yet. And there is a very good chance that you're going to get hurt. And a lot of us, because we've been hurt, we walk into church like this. We have like this force field. (laughs) And we're just like, you know, don't come too close. I'm not going to let anybody in my life, I'm not going to let them get too close to me because I can't handle that anymore. I've been hurt by too many Christians. If you have that attitude, you're never going to be able to disciple someone. Because you have to let them in your life. You have to let down your guard. You have to actually, you have to accept the fact that it is a very good chance the people you disciple are going to hurt you. Because they're imperfect and they're young and they're immature. And it's very likely to happen. So, this is the verse that I think we all should put on our bathroom mirror. Just write it on a post-it note and tape it to your mirror. Read it every day. Every time you start thinking, I'm going to put my force field up. I'm not going to let that person in my life. I've been hurt too many times. Read this. Ephesians 4, 30 to 32. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Pretty much covers it all, right? Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice. You want to add anything to that list? (laughs) I think Paul covered it all here. By the Holy Spirit, he's like, let it all go. Let all the toxic attitudes, don't let it turn into bitterness. Just learn to let it roll off of you and just keep going. And if you're going to be effective in disciple making, you've got to be quick to forgive and let go of those hurts. Y'all still love me? I'm telling you the truth. A lot of people just don't want to go down this road. They don't want to go in the realm of discipleship because it's painful. It requires them to stretch their love a lot. And then they're going to get somebody's going to bite their head off or offend them or hurt them or say something or do something. Paul the apostle had people betraying him all the time. And yet he continued faithfully to pour his life into others. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. The last decision that you're going to have to make. And we're going to pray in a moment. And you're going to pray over these decisions. Let's go over what we've said so far. What's the first thing you're going to do? Come out of hiding. Number two. Let go of your hurts. Number three is open your heart to invest in others. Now, I'm going to show you this next picture, and I want to hear, what do, you, what do people normally do when they see a picture like this? 
Oh. Why do we all do that? Why do we all go, oh, even the guys, oh, when you see a, a mom or a dad holding a little baby. And you see that and you just, you know, you just want to kiss that face. You want to kiss every part of that bald head. Why are we like that? Because our Heavenly Father is like that. And he put that in us. He put that loving affection, especially for the little ones. He put that in us. We are that way because we're like our Father. He made us in his image. And we are going to have to learn to allow the love of God, the Father's love, we're going to have to allow that love to ooze out of us and we're going to have to learn to express it and learn to channel it and, and learn to uh, pour it out on the people that Jesus has put in our lives uh, who are to be like spiritual sons and daughters. That's what we're going to be learning about this weekend. Discipleship is really becoming a spiritual parent for people. And if you are going to be a parent, you have to be able to do that. You have to have affect affection. You have to have love for the people that you care about. Discipleship is not some, it's not about being, uh, doing something clinical. It's not just doing some kind of professional class or you know a seminar discipleship is slobbery <laughs> discipleship is warm and friendly and loving it's got to be it cannot just be a mechanical process and a lot of us have learned it that way we're going to have to unlearn that and we're going to have to learn to do it God's way first Corinthians four fifteen, the apostle Paul he said, for if I were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Paul allowed God's love to so flow through him that he became a spiritual father to many people. And that affection and that love flowed out of him. It doesn't mean that he didn't correct them. He did it like a father would. But Paul was full of God's Father's heart of love for people. And that's what we need. And that's what we need to pray for. This whole concept um, came alive to me a few years ago. Um, you know, I had read for since I was young in the Lord. I had read the scripture in Romans 8, 15. That says God adopted us as his children. And it says that when we believe in Jesus, that the spirit of adoption comes in our hearts and that we cry out, Abba, Father. Y'all know that verse? So I've heard that all my life. I could probably preach a sermon on the spirit of adoption. But then, 11 years ago, my oldest daughter, my wife and I have four daughters, and my oldest daughter, uh, she and her husband took a mission trip to Ethiopia. And while they were over there, God spoke to her that they were to adopt a baby from Ethiopia. And so they went through this long process. It was very tedious, very, very expensive. But they finally went to Ethiopia and they brought back this little baby boy. And I have a picture of him right there. Uh, and when he came to America, he was, he his, his first birthday was the day that they brought him back. And um, when they brought that little boy to their home, and my wife and I went to see them that day, and I held that little boy in my arms, and he was bald-headed at the time. <laughs> um, you know, I, and his name is Grady. His, he, his first name is my last name. And, you know, he doesn't exactly look like me, but he's my grandson. Legally, he has an American passport. He has his parents' name. He is legally adopted. And I held that little boy in my arms and I kissed every square inch of that bald head and that little face. And now he is the love of my life. He just went on his first ministry trip with granddaddy. 
that this boy taught me what it really means when we were adopted by God. How many of you are grateful tonight that your father adopted you? <laughs> that you were way off somewhere far away like Grady was? And your loving Heavenly Father paid all the fees to adopt you and, and signed all the forms and the legal documents to put your name in the Lamb's Book of Life and you are His and you belong to Him and He loves you and He holds you and He embraces you and He slobbers all over you. That's our Heavenly Father. That same love, is that, that adoptive love, is what we have to convey to the people that we are discipling. So I want, you under, I want you to understand that what we're talking about this weekend is not just a clinical process. You're asking God, Lord, I thank you that you adopted me and I'm so grateful that I'm a part of your family now. But there's other people out there who need to know this love and they need me to show them how to find that. They need me to be like a spiritual mom or dad for them. I can't do it perfectly. I'm not perfect, but I can be obedient to you and I can allow your spirit to flow through me and I can convey that love to them. And you know what's going to happen? You are going to really and truly adopt them into your life. And they're going to become like spiritual children to you. You may some of you in here may not even have biological children, but you know what? You could have tons of spiritual children. Because of the miracle of discipleship. So this last verse. I, uh, just You can skip that next slide. In this last verse. Philippians 1. 7 to 8. And, I, and then we're going to pray. This verse from the Apostle Paul. Really to me. Captures the essence of the heart of a disciple maker. Paul said. For it is only right for me. To feel this way about you all. Because I have you in my heart. For God is my witness how I long for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. I don't know if you already have people in your life like that. Uh, if you would go back to the previous slide. When I turned 50 years old. And that was a while back. I was already discipling a lots of young men, but I made a decision that year. I said, Lord, it's never been about me, but from now on, <laughs> it is not about me. I want to spend every waking moment pouring my life into the next generation. And so that's been my life ever since. I am constantly surrounded with, a lot of times, young men who are the age of my own children. And I'm just, I have the amazing privilege to pour my life into them, to model the Christian life, and to help them uh, understand what it means to follow Jesus. And the result is I have a lot of sons now. My wife and I have four daughters. I tell people I've been drowning in a sea of estrogen since 1985. But now I have more spiritual sons than I know what to do with. Because the Lord gave me this adoptive heart. So, I want you to make your own little altar where you are sitting there. I want you to bow your heads. I want you to bow your hearts. And I want you to just examine your heart for a moment. I want, I want to ask you, do you need to come out from behind some walls have you been in hiding have you been pu pulling back from people and if so you can never be an effective disciple maker if you have that attitude you need to make the decision I'm going to be in community I'm going to live in community with the people that God has put around me and I'm going to embrace the assembling of of my church that my, my spiritual family and there's some of you maybe who you just say I need to let go of some hurts I have been hurt 
And I'm not making fun or minimize, minimizing the pain of what you may have felt. By, and, and sometimes when Christian leaders hurt us, that's, that's when it's really traumatic. And I feel like there's more than one person in this room tonight that you've been through some pain with some leaders and, you know, it did cause you to pull back. But tonight I'm asking you to choose to let go of that. Forgive again those people who hurt you. And then I want to ask you to choose tonight to open your heart to invest in others. Um, if I don't know if it's possible we can have somebody just come up and play quietly before I pray this last thing, but... I want to ask all of you right now to be super honest. If there's anybody in here tonight and you would say, I really have been hurt. And I know that I've held back. I've stayed behind the line. I have been behind a wall because of those hurts. It doesn't have to be anybody in this room. Maybe it was. I don't know. But you know that you've held back from building close relationships because of the pain of past relationships. If there's anybody in that boat, I want to ask you to please have the courage to simply stand where you are. And we're going to pray tonight. I, I think it's important for you to be open about that. This is a safe place for us. But we need to deal with this. So if you have had some church hurt, or maybe it's some family drama, you know, I, I, I feel there's someone here that um, there was some pretty deep hurts with your parents, and that that it's in itself has caused you to be cautious with leaders, people in authority. And I want to ask you to stand up if that's you. Thank you. I want to give you just a moment. There's a, a lady in here tonight that there was a lot of trauma and pain in your uh, kind of like your preteen and teen years. Might have been a long time ago, but it's it's real. And it has caused you to basically create a shell around yourself. And it's going to hinder you from being the woman of God that he's called you to be. And you, today, if you would just acknowledge the need to come out of that, to let go of that, he's going to lovingly coax you out of that shell. And you're going to actually become one who invests in others. Would you please let Jesus invade that place? Anyone else that needs to stand. The Holy Spirit is working on all of us. We're all, you know, broken people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's just choose tonight to be honest with the Lord and with each other. That's the most important thing. The Bible says that when we confess our sins to one another, we will be healed. And in some cases, this is not your sin. It's what somebody else did to you. But if we hold those people in judgment and allow bitterness to take root or we just close our hearts, we got to let go of that. Now, everybody who's standing, just stay right where you are. And then I want everyone else to just look around near you. And if there's somebody standing, I want you to get up and I want you to go over and just stand next to that person. You can put your arm on their shoulder, their, your hand on their shoulder or their elbow and just let them know that you're there. Because we're here to support each other and the Holy Spirit works through his body 
So just let them know that you're there. I want them to feel the... I want, I want these people to feel the affection and the love of the body of Christ. Lord Jesus, I pray for my friends who have had the courage to stand up tonight and admit that their hearts have been broken and closed and they've been wounded, Lord. The enemy has used these, these experiences to try to shut them down. But Lord, I declare over them tonight that the enemy's strategies are broken. The enemy can no longer use those memories to close them down and to shut down the flow of your love and your anointing in their lives. Lord, these people who stood up, Lord, these are people that you want to use powerfully to make disciples and to invest in others and to show your love and your compassion to believers and unbelievers. So, Lord, we thank you tonight that these hurts are melting away. We choose to let go of bitterness. We choose to let go of any unforgiveness. We choose to just let go of the pain of those memories. Some of you just need to, those of you standing in prayer, you just need to lift your hands and just physically give God that burden right now. Just give him that weight. Give it to him right now. And that woman that was traumatized in your teen years, the Lord is just stepping right into that place tonight. And I just see him opening up this bottle of oil and he's just pouring the oil all over that memory. He's healing that place. And it's not going to hold you back. Lord, we choose tonight to let go. And we receive your healing right now in Jesus' name. There's a, there's a brother standing tonight as well. And you have just felt like there was a, a metal casing around your heart. It just seems very, very hard for you to show what you really feel to people. You feel almost numb in your emotions. I feel tonight the Lord is just cracking open that, that hard casing around your heart. He's doing a work and he's going to continue to do the work even in your sleep tonight. I think you're even going to wake up a few times in the middle of the night and feel like God's doing surgery on your heart because you're getting free from that pain. Lord, we welcome your healing tonight. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit working in our midst. And now could we all just stand together and would you just lift your hands in surrender to the Lord. And I want you just in your own way, just tell the Lord that you're willing to open up your heart so that you can be a spiritual mom or a spiritual dad, a big brother, a big sister, a mentor, that you are willing to be that for others. The Lord needs you before we go into any practical training tomorrow. He needs you to say, Lord, I'm willing for you to use me that way. Don't give him any excuses. Don't tell him, Lord, I don't know the Bible well enough. I don't feel like I'm qualified. I feel like I've messed up too many times. Don't give him the excuses that we all tend to do. But just say, Lord, here am I. Use me. Here am I. Send me. Let me be that mom or dad to those people who need a hug and they need a, a, a firm guide through life. They need some counsel. They need some instruction. They need to see what it looks like to be a Christian. And I'm willing to be that model, that, that role model to them. Just tell Jesus that you're willing to do that. And then I believe the Lord takes that as a sweet smelling sacrifice 
and he's ready to do something with us. Lord, we love you tonight. Can you just tell him that you love him? Can you just worship him for a moment and thank him for what he's doing? Thank you, Jesus. Now, I'm going to ask you to do what I asked you to do at the beginning. I want you to go and hug somebody. But, I, but before you do, I want to remind you, in the Bible, there's five times in the Bible, in the New Testament, it says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, some people say, well, that was just Italians. I don't think it would be in the Bible five times if maybe the Lord didn't want us to be a little bit more slobbery in our love for each other. So y'all can do what you want, but I want you to love each other and hug each other and then we'll be dismissed. Okay. Did you all appreciate Lee tonight? Was that good? Amen. That was so good. Thank you, Lee. This is what I needed to hear tonight. If you have kids, make sure you get them soon. Uh, we need to let their children's workers go. We will see you at 845 in the morning. We'll have a continental breakfast and we'll start at nine. So get some good sleep tonight and get ready for some great deeper waters tomorrow in discipleship. Love you guys. Make sure you get that big hug before you leave. Here is where I lay it down, and every bird and every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. <laughs>